16-year-old Heidi Dawn Wilbur was last seen on February 9, 1991. At the time of her disappearance, she was in the custody of the Vermont Department of Social and Rehabilitation Services and living with a foster family in Rutland City. The weekend she went missing, she had received a weekend pass to visit her biological family in Middletown Springs. During the visit, investigators believe she ran away by hitchhiking and has never been seen again. Her family believes she may have run away to Florida, and a relative vacationing at Walt Disney World claims to have seen her during her visit. There is also some unverified information that she may have been arrested in Florida in 2012. Also in 2012, a skull was found on Danby Hill Road in Danby, Vermont. The skull was originally thought to be from a Caucasian woman, leading some to believe it might be part of the remains of Heidi or maybe even another missing girl from the state. However, it was later determined to be that of an Asian female who met with possible foul play somewhere between the ages of 21 and 40 years old. While there have been other reports of her living in Florida, she still remains a missing person and the case remains unsolved. Brianna Alexandra Maitland was born October 8, 1986. On her 17th birthday, she decided to move away from her parents' farm to be closer to her friends. She transferred high schools and lived in and out of several of her friends' homes. By the end of February 2004, she had dropped out of school and moved in with her childhood friend, Jillian, in Sheldon, Vermont. She then enrolled in a GED program and began working two jobs as a waitress and a dishwasher. On March 19, 2004, Brianna passed her GED exam and she and her mother had lunch to celebrate. Brianna was in good spirits and spoke of plans to attend college part-time. After lunch, Brianna and her mother spent the afternoon shopping and running errands. While waiting in the checkout line of a store, her mother said something outside caught Brianna's attention. She told her mother she would return shortly and left the store. When her mother Kelly met her in the parking lot, she noticed that Brianna seemed shaken and agitated. Not wanting to pry, her mother didn't ask what had happened and dropped Brianna off at home between 3.30 and 4 p.m. This was the last time she saw her daughter. At some point before leaving for her work shift, Brianna left a note for her roommate saying she would return after work that evening. The last time she was seen was leaving her dishwashing job at the Black Lantern Inn in Montgomery, Vermont at 11.20 p.m. Her co-workers asked her to have dinner with them, but she declined because she was tired and had to get up early to go to her second job as a waitress. When she didn't arrive home, her roommate thought she might have moved back in with her parents. As several days passed, her roommate decided to call Brianna's parents, and that is when she was told that Brianna wasn't there and a missing persons report was filed. Brianna's 1985 sedan was found on March 20th, the day after she was last seen, off East Berkshire Road and Route 118, across from Dutchburn Farm Road, backed into an abandoned farmhouse. This location is only a mile from the Black Lantern Inn, where she was working the night she was last seen. Two of her uncashed paychecks were on the front seat of the car. Outside of the car was a water bottle, an unsmoked cigarette, jewelry, and some loose change. A woman's fleece jacket was also found in a field near Brianna's car, but it apparently did not belong to her. Her car had minor damage and had apparently backed into the building and punctured a hole in the wall. The trooper assumed the car had been abandoned by a drunk driver and a towing company took the vehicle to a local garage. Investigators later believed the accident may have been staged. Police did not initially report the abandoned car to Brianna's mother, who was the registered owner. Her mother did not learn about the discovery of the car until five days afterward. The abandoned car and Brianna's disappearance were not connected until the missing persons report was filed three days later. There has been some speculation that Brianna's disappearance is related to the disappearance of Mara Murray, a nursing student from Massachusetts who vanished February 9, 2004 in Haverville, New Hampshire after getting into a car accident. The FBI met with local authorities to discuss possible links between the cases. Both Mara and Brianna disappeared after car accidents in which their cars were left behind with personal items inside and were similar in appearances. 
However, the FBI and local law enforcement concluded that, despite the apparent similarities, Mara and Brianna's cases were probably not connected to each other. However, the theory was not completely ruled out. About three weeks before Brianna disappeared, she was allegedly attacked by a former female friend, Keeley, in front of several witnesses. The reasons for the assault are unclear, but Brianna's father later stated that he believed it stemmed from jealousy over her interaction with a boy at a party. Although Brianna had extensive training in jiu-jitsu, she did not try to defend herself and instead just sat in the truck of Keeley's ex-boyfriends. After the attack, she went to the hospital and received treatment for a broken nose, facial cuts, and a concussion. She then filed a criminal complaint against Keeley, and the case was still pending when Brianna disappeared. After she vanished, the district attorney dropped the complaint against the objections of Brianna's parents. Police stated that Keeley was cleared of any involvement in her disappearance. After Brianna's disappearance, several people came forward to law enforcement to report sightings of her car at the old Dutchburn house the night she disappeared. A man who drove by the house between 11.30 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. on the night of March 19th said the car's headlights may have been on. This would have been right after she left work that night. He said he did not see anyone in or around the car. A second man who drove by between midnight and 12.30 a.m. on Saturday, March 20th, recalled seeing a turn signal flashing on the car. Around 4 a.m. on Saturday, March 20th, a former boyfriend of Brianna's drove past the scene after a night of partying across the border in Canada. He thought he recognized the vehicle, but he did not see anyone in or around it. The next morning, some passing motorists found the scene odd enough that they stopped and took pictures of it. On March 30th, 2004, after her car had been impounded for several days, it was processed for evidence by the state crime lab. Upon the car's return to her parents, her father noted that her ATM card, glasses, contact lens case, and migraine medication had all been left inside. Her parents publicly speculated that she may have been abducted by multiple people because it would have been difficult for a single assailant to subdue her given her jiu-jitsu training. In March 2016, 12 years after she disappeared, investigators revealed they had recovered DNA samples from Brianna's car. However, the results of the DNA test were not made public. In July 2016, the farmhouse where her vehicle was discovered was destroyed in a fire. As of today, Brianna has never been found and the case remains unsolved. Twenty-eight-year-old Dean Webster was a well-known and very well-liked person in the Rochester community in Vermont. He was described as a clumsy jokester who took hunting seriously. On November 16, 2001, Dean was shot once in the head and once to the chest outside the home he was building in Rochester. His body would be discovered the next day on November 17 by one of his friends. The shooting happened only six days into Vermont's rifle season, leading some to believe it might have been a hunting accident, but Detective Tyson Keeney knows otherwise. He says that there were multiple shots and they could determine the killer was less than 50 feet away, proving it was no hunting accident. Dean was a very private person and was building a home in a remote location which made the investigation very difficult. There are very few details in the case, but we do know he was supposed to meet his sister on the night of November 15th, the day before he was shot, but he never showed up and a neighbor saw him on the afternoon of the 16th. In 2017, detectives were going back through the case and did uncover some new evidence. However, they aren't revealing what it is because only the killer would know about it. All these years later, the family is still seeking answers, Dean's killer has never been found, and the case remains unsolved. Vincent Palmieri, who lived in Staten Island, New York, was a 35-year-old man that vanished around May 1, 1972. He married his childhood sweetheart, and the couple had nine children together. His wife, Annette, filed a missing persons report on May 5, 1972. During the search for him, they would find his abandoned car at the JFK Airport in Queens, New York. About a month later, the body of a partially dressed man with distinctive tattoos was discovered by a sewage repair worker. The body was found about 350 miles from Staten Island in the Passumsic River in Vermont and had been shot multiple times. 
The man had a gold pinky ring on and the name Annette tattooed on his upper right forearm and surrounding a heart on his lower arm was Then Love A.U., a tribute to his wife's maiden name, Annette Uricola. It turned out to be Vincent Palmieri, but it would take 35 years to identify him and another 10 years before his family was connected to him. During those 45 years, his wife and their nine children never knew his body had washed ashore one month after his disappearance. In 1972, there was no internet, no national fingerprint database, and no DNA technology available. Therefore, the case would go cold and police would label him as the Pasumsic River Floater. During those 45 years, his remains lay in a grave with an anonymous marker in Lakeview Cemetery in Burlington, Vermont, until the Vermont State Police located and contacted his children in 2017. They brought their father's remains home to be buried on Staten Island next to their mother who passed away in 2015 of natural causes. In 2020, his family filed an $800,000 lawsuit against the state of Vermont and the Vermont State Police. The lawsuit alleges shoddy investigative work by Vermont police detectives and a lack of effort to identify the body when he was first found in 2006. The gun that killed Vincent, a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver, was linked to two other slayings in Greater Springfield, Vermont, within weeks of his death. The bodies of organized crime figure Victor Dakara and a low-level criminal Gary Dubay also turned up in watery graves riddled with bullets. Only Gary's murder was solved. Francis Soffin, a notorious outlaw and bank robber who died in prison in 2015, pleaded guilty in 1973 to killing Gary and another man, Stephen Perot. Available police and court records offer little evidence of any meaningful investigation into Victor's killing, other than a short missing person report filed with Agwan Police Department. The Hamden District Attorney's Office does not appear to have a single investigative file linked to his death. At the time, the agency was led by the late Matthew Ryan, who reportedly had an association with gangsters and was known to shut down certain investigations. Victor's unsolved murder is not even listed in the cold case database on the Hampton County District Attorney's website, which features cases dating back to the late 1950s. For years, the critical link among the three deaths was neither publicized nor probed by law enforcement until the Palmieri family began its own investigation. They asked why their father met the same end with the same gun as Gary Dubay, a witness against Francis Soffin and Victor Dakara, who allegedly took an interest in the wrong gangster's wife and disappeared from the parking lot of his restaurant near the Agwam Rotary. Soffin was a well-known hitman during his criminal heyday in the 1960s and 70s, leading a group of outlaws known as the Soffin Gang. But Vincent's family says to their knowledge he had no connection with Soffin and no ties to the greater Springfield area or anyone in New England. While the bodies of all three men were dumped in waterways between Connecticut and Vermont, Vincent's was the farthest from home, suggesting his killer or killers wanted him to stay gone. Vincent was identified by Vermont State Police in 2006 using the National FBI Fingerprint Database. Now retired Captain J.P. Sinclair, who headed the state's cold case unit, helped the Palmieri children bring their father's remains home a decade later. Sinclair said they were unable to find the next of kin until a young researcher decided to try Ancestry.com and got a hit. Sinclair said their bodies were never publicly linked through a ballistics report, which is a curious thing since it did exist. The ballistics report by the Connecticut State Police Lab in the state where Victor's body was found sat dormant and the reason remains unclear. In 1972, the lab identified a common 38 caliber pistol to link the killings. Soffin pleaded guilty to Gary's murder in 1973, plus the murder of Stephen with a different weapon. Sinclair said during initial interrogation after Soffin's arrest, he made a vague reference about the man found in the river in Vermont being a nobody from Springfield, but there was never any apparent follow-up. Vincent had no criminal record and only a single arrest in his youth, and Vermont police could never track down the arrest report. 
The Palmieri family cannot even locate the missing person report their mother filed with New York City police. Vincent Jr. stated in an interview, if this was a mob hit, they would have whacked him in the middle of the street and left him there as a message. That's how the mob does that. This wasn't that. In 2019, a 48-year-old woman from New Jersey approached the Palmieri's to inform them they shared the same father. She said she made the discovery through a DNA test ordered on the internet. According to the Palmieri's, the woman's mother initially denied any connection to the late Vincent Palmieri Sr. in interviews with police. But Vincent Jr. said she later admitted to her daughter that she knew his father. The woman's mother had been married to a man with a long criminal history who raised Palmieri's child as his own. However, the woman's mother and stepfather has since passed away. Vincent's family has been told that the records repository where any documentation may have been held was washed away by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Nobody has ever been arrested for Vincent's death and the case remains unsolved. Lynn Catherine Schultze was born February 9, 1953 and grew up in Connecticut. After graduating high school, Lynn went on to enroll at Middlebury College. On December 10, 1971, the 18-year-old freshman had an end-of-the-semester exam in her English drama class that she had been studying hard for. Around noon, she was seen at a local food store called All Good Things on Court Street in Middlebury buying dried prunes. Soon after, she was seen standing outside of the store eating the prunes near the bus stop. Strangely, she told a fellow student at the bus stop that she was going to take a bus to New York, although the bus had already left. The next time she was seen was 12.45 p.m. in her dorm room by a fellow student that was also scheduled to take the exam. She left her room at 12.55 p.m. When she was on her way with her friends to take the final exam, she said she had forgotten her favorite pen and was going to go back to get it. The exam was scheduled for 1 p.m., but Lynn never showed up. At 2.15, Lynn was seen by a fellow student standing on Court Street, across the street from the All Good Things store, and back at the bus stop where she'd been earlier. This would be the last time anyone saw or heard from her. She left her identification, checkbook, and all her personal belongings behind in her dorm room when she vanished. Campus security was notified of her disappearance two days after she was last seen, but her parents were not notified for a week. Lynn had mentioned the idea of faking her own death and starting a new life prior to her disappearance, but her friends did not take her seriously. In the letter she wrote frequently to family and friends back home, she admitted she felt homesick and had considered withdrawing from school. However, she never indicated she was planning on dropping out of sight or leaving college before the autumn term was over. She had also already registered for her spring semester classes. Her relatives don't believe she was unusually distressed. She took her English drama class seriously, had perfect attendance, and studied hard for her final exam, which she never made it to. Although her academic performance at Middlebury wasn't as good as it had been in high school, she wasn't failing any classes either. There were several possible sightings of Lynn after her disappearance, but none of them were confirmed. The store she was last seen at, All Good Things, was owned by none other than Robert Durst. If you are unfamiliar with Robert Durst, he lived in the Middlebury area for about two years and was the heir and son to a wealthy New York City tycoon. Before I continue with Robert Durst, if you don't want me to spoil his story, go watch The Jinx on HBO. I highly recommend it. Robert Durst had a long history of death surrounding him. His first wife, Kathy Durst, would go missing in 1982. His neighbor in Texas was found dismembered, and Durst was later charged with the crime but acquitted, and his best friend, Susan Berman, was found shot to death in her California home, and in 2015, he was arrested and charged in her death. He was also the suspect in the disappearance of Karen Mitchell from Eureka, California in 1997. In July 2012, police received a tip that Durst had owned All Good Things in 1971 where Lynn was last seen. However, they did not reveal this detail publicly until Robert Durst's arrest made headlines a few years later. As of today, Lynn has never been found and this case remains unsolved. <music> 